Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Lunch with the Pastor weekly Bible study. This is our second episode of The Martyrs as we look back on history to those that have given everything for the faith. Um, remember what I talked about last week, learning about the martyrs is seeing what it really looks like to find your purpose and your focus solely on God. It doesn't always have to be about someone who loses their life. As we learned last week, uh, our martyr didn't lose his life due to his faith, although he did put his life and the lives of those that are around him in serious harm um, or in serious danger, I should say, um, that they could have uh, very easily lost their lives. So being a martyr doesn't always mean that you lose your life, but it does mean that your focus is solely on God. The men and women are faithful persons that, and this is the one thing that I really want us to hear, very, I want you to hear, I want me to hear, because I need to hear it sometimes, uh, I need to hear it just as much as you do. They are no better and no worse than any of the rest of us. They're just regular human beings trying their best to be exactly what God has called them to be. And in these particular moments, they tend to hit this pinnacle that we all should be so blessed to get to. It's when they're faced with that ultimate choice. Either they choose the world or they choose God. And we get to see inside these moments and see what they what happens when they choose God with full conviction because they knew that while this world has the ability to take everything away, their God, our God, has the even bigger ability to give everything back and more. Um, Jim Elliott was a missionary to Ecuador and a martyr of the faith, and he said this. He says, a person is no fool who gives what they cannot keep in order to gain what they cannot lose. It's a beautiful sentiment of what a martyr truly is. And as I said before, it doesn't always have to be the fact that a martyr has to be one who dies. Although a lot of times when we talk about the martyrs, that's exactly what happened. But as we continue, I want you to keep these two points in the forefront of your mind as we go through each of the stories that we're going to talk about over the next coming weeks. The first thing is I want you to remember and put in the forefront of your mind Christ's words to all who want to become his disciples. You want to become my disciple. You want to become my follower. Pick up your cross and follow me. This means 100% that we are called to go into unfavorable, difficult, dangerous, and life-threatening places because of the gospel message. Remember Jesus's words in Matthew. He says, see, I am sending you out like sheep into the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. That's in Matthew 10, right? That was Jesus' statement to them. And later through that passage through, uh, from 16 to 23, he talks about the fact that those that are around him, the world will not agree with them. Fathers will betray sons. Sons will betray fathers. Mothers and daughters will go after each other. They will, this, the synagogue and the cities will hate you because of my name, right? That's the whole thing. Everyone's going to persecute you because you are mine. This is how it works. He never promised us an easy life. Now, the, fun, the, the thing about all of, this, all of these statements is the fact that the best part is that phrase when Jesus says, if you want to be a follower, pick up your cross. That's the doom part, but it's not all that way. The hope there is there too, because we are following him. Remember that there is always comfort in knowing that when we pick up that cross, we do not go it alone. We are following our master. We are following the king. We are following the one who not only saves, but the one who has gone through the whole process already and has already come out the other side so that he can bring, to use his words correctly, he can bring us to himself right? This is Jesus' promise to us. And because he is God incarnate, we know that he is faithful to fulfill his promise. 
The second thing I want you to always keep your keep in front of you as we go through these martyrs is just like it what it is a good way to grow your trust in God by dwelling on the blessings and faithfulness. You've heard me talk about that. And we've talked about prayer and how we can go back into our lives and go, okay, God did this for me and this for me and this for me, which is going to help us when we get to those times of trial, because we have those laundry lists of this is when God was faithful to me, right? And now even though the world will tell me that God's not faithful, I have all of this proof that God is faithful, right? We've done that before. We've talked about it before. It's an important part of our faith journey. It's an important part of the entire gospel lesson in, in, in the entire scriptures. The Israelites, all of their festivals were all about remembering what God did for them, right? To remind themselves over and over again that they are his people, that it's a good thing to be his people, that they are worship, that they worship the right God, all that kind of stuff. Learning about the martyrs and learn and studying them is exactly the same thing. It's good for us as followers to see and discuss examples of radical faith so that when it's our turn, when those ultimate questions come knocking on our door, we have some idea of what we're supposed to do with them. As I said last week, our martyrdom, one, uh, our way of answering that ultimate question, it may not be that life or death situation like we read about last week or the one that we're going to read about this week or the next few weeks. It may not be quite as life or death as those situations, but a martyr is not simply one who loses his or her life for the gospel. A martyr is one who bears testimony to the true gospel regardless of the cost. That cost may be your life. It also may be your stat social status, your job, your family members, your friends, and so many other things in this world. But the bottom line is, is that it's going to, if it costs you something, specifically if it costs you something that you don't want to get rid of, that's what being a martyr is. And by looking at some of the extreme examples of martyrdom, I hope that we can all find it within ourselves to exhibit the same kind of strength when our turn comes. Now, today, we're going to look back far, much farther into history than we did last week. Remember last week, we talked about uh, a gentleman in pretty much present day Middle East. And this today, we're going to look back all the way to the 1400s. So a few years uh, before any of us were alive. Um, now, the person we're going to look at today actually has, and, and we're going to see this as it unfolds, it ha he has his roots in the Methodist tradition. So Let's let me take you a journey on a journey to our martyr for today. Now, as early as the 1400s, there were rumblings of what we now call the Protestant Reformation. Now, of course, most of us know Martin Luther, right? We know his famous theses that were nailed up to the church door about all the different things that he didn't like about how the Catholic Church ran and operated, how he felt that they were not in. To, in 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 step with the scriptures, um, and and we know that that sparked the separation between the Protestants and the Catholics. Right now, while Luther may get all the glory for sticking it to the Pope and to the Roman Catholic Church it would be foolish of us to believe that he was the only one. And certainly we, it would be foolish of us to believe that he was the first one. The man that we talk about today is actually another priest within the Catholic church who found a certain practice within the church to be out of tune with the scriptures and his purpose, the thing that he didn't like, the thing that he wanted to change, the thing that he wanted to, let's use the word, reform, in the church was one of the major pieces of what Martin Luther didn't like about the church. And his, the, the man's name, the martyr's name that we will talk about today is Jan Hus, J-A-N-H-U-S, Jan Hus. Now, the practice that Jan didn't like the, is the same kind of practice that Luther would build most of his case upon when Luther finally nailed his theses up to the door. Yes, he had a truckload of them, but the bottom line is there was one really, really big thing on his list that 
a lot of historians believe if that one thing could have been taken care of, he would have not been so upset about all the others. And Jan had the same problem. Now, the problem was indulgences. Now, some of you may be looking at the screen going, what's an indulgence? What is this? Why did they have a problem with it? So for those of you that are not familiar with this practice, let me explain it just a little bit so that you get an understanding of what it is. One of the practices of Catholics that almost everyone knows, regardless if you're Christian or not, is the practice of confession, right? A time when a parishioner spends in a box with a local priest to confess and receive absolutions for sins that they have committed between the time of their last confession and this particular time that they are now in the confessional box. It's meant to be a beautiful and soul-cleansing part of the Christian faith, whereby the sinner is able to truly act upon the Lord's command that we repent, that we repent of our sins in order to receive forgiveness. Now, while we as Protestants might think it, find it difficult and think it weird to walk into their pastors, or for y'all, for those of you that are part of my uh, congregation, to walk into my office <laughs> and confess your deepest, darkest secrets to me, yes, it would be weird for us as Protestants because we just aren't not used to it. But the fact of the matter is, is that the scriptures have a number of times within them that urge us to do exactly that, to find trusted brothers and sisters in the faith, to confess to, to allow those trusted and loved brothers and sisters to hold us accountable, to force us to change the way that we view. One of the best ones in it is James chapter 5, verse 16, where he says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. This whole idea of our faith being communal in the sense that when we sin, we sin against the whole body. So the whole body needs to be part of the healing ritual. Now, what indulgences were was part of the repentance part of the confession. So a person would go into the box, they'd tell the priest all of their sins. The priest would say, okay, I've heard all of your sins. Now, you have to do something in order for those sins to be forgiven. In the Middle Ages, priests would regularly tell the parishioner that in order to be absolved of their sin and in the Catholic Church, if you were not a, if you once you became absolved of your sin, then you could partake of the Mass communion. But if you hadn't, you weren't permitted at the table. That they needed to do something in order to atone for their sins in the eyes of God, and this is where indulgences came in, because they were the things that you had to do. Now, a lot of times it was simple stuff. You needed to go into a time of prayer. You needed to fast. You needed to um, go and apologize to the person whom you wrong. I, there's a truckload of things that you could have done, all of which would have been helpful and, and, and healthy to actually go down the road of repentance. Unfortunately, indulgences became something that was not part of the scriptures. It got so bad that around Luther's day, the parishioners were being told that if they gave enough money to the church, that not only could their own sins be absolved, but so could the sins of those whom they loved. A, pre, a, 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 a parishioner would come in and say his daughter committed suicide. For those of you that aren't aware of the Catholic uh, understanding of suicide, suicide is deemed to be a, an unrepentant sin, which means that any suicide victim goes direct, their souls go directly to hell. But the church would then come to that person and say, you know what, if you gave a lump, lump sum of $10,000, your daughter's soul would find its way to heaven. Sounds weird, doesn't it? But for a grieving parent, that would be a godsend, a, a grace that would be so readily, uh, that, that, that would be wanting to be so readily available, right? So essentially, what indulgences became were ways to purchase yours and, by extension, someone else's way into heaven. Now, that should curl your toes a little bit about the idea of being able to purchase your way into heaven or even purchasing someone else's way into heaven. 
that's not the power of the church, nor is that the power of anyone else save God alone. Even Christ says that is not even his power, but it is God the Father's power. So this indulgence thing really butts heads with the scriptures. And Jan Hus, our martyr for today, was one of the very first to protest this practice of indulgences as it was starting to become something that was no longer scriptural. It was no longer healthy. It was more and more about what the person could do for the church than what the person could do for God. Now, Jan preached in uh, Bohemia, which is now in the Czech Republic. And what he preached was that indulgences were a sin of themselves, by themselves. And that the Catholic Church had lost their way by allowing them to be part of the ritual. He was excommunicated from the church. He was stripped of his title and his office, and he was defamed by the papacy and cast aside. He continued to preach what he knew to be the true gospel. His staunch belief in the scriptures and in Christ being the only thing that can get anyone into heaven was the sole reason for him losing everything that he had worked for in his life. He lost everything the world could take from him. He lost his job. He lost his status. He lost everything that he could. But even after losing all of that, he lost something more. After he had been kicked out, excommunicated, all that stuff, he continued to still preach. And so finally, a trial was brought forward. He was asked to appear before this board of four bishops, and he did so willingly, thinking that it was a, going to be an honest trial where he could present his findings, and if he was proved right, and if his logic held sound and theology held sound, then he would be given back his title and given back everything else, and the church could actually reform into what he truly believed the church ought to be and should be. Unfortunately, the trial was a complete sham. And he was not brought there for him to change their minds, but rather for them to force him to change his. Now, in, these, in this story, I want to see two things about this martyr story that I think will help us when it's our turn for that ultimate choice, right? When it's on those times when it, the choice between serving the world or serving God happen to be in our grasp. And as I said before, it doesn't always have to be life or death, but every little choice, we need to be able to choose God over the world every time. The first point that I really want us to understand is that Jan had a drive inside him that kept him from changing his story, no matter the torture or promises of the four bishops. Now, part of this part of his story is when he was brought before the trial, they imprisoned him immediately, and they tortured him day after day after day, and then brought him before the, tri the, the tribunal, brought him before the four bishops and would tell him, all you have to do is recant of all of your preachings. Tell a, tell the, uh, say that what you thought was incorrect. Say that you made a mistake and we will let you go and you will be free. We will give you back everything that you want. Everything that we took from you, you can have back as long as you recant your preaching. And every day he would tell them, no, he would sta staunchly stay, stand behind his choice, staunchly stay behind his theology and his understanding of the gospel. And every day he said no, they would send him back down and he would be tortured again. In Mark chapter 9, verse 42, it sa Jesus says, If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. This is one of personally my most, well, I shouldn't say even most favorite. It is one of my most known scriptures because to me as a pastor, it is a scripture that weighs heavy on my heart and on my soul. Because I know that I am that person. Every pastor is. We are charged with being the leaders of a congregation. And when Jesus says, before one of these little ones who believe in me, he is not speaking directly of a child. He is speaking of those whom are in the infancy of faith. 
those whom are younger than you in the faith, not by years, but by faith. And as pastors, our job is to guide our congregations towards the truth, towards the kingdom. And Jesus warns all pastors the same way. If you put a stumbling block before the congregation members that I have placed in your charge, it would be better for you to have a great millstone hung around your neck and thrown into the sea. That's the reason that this verse weighs so heavy on me, because I always want to be the best version of myself. I always want to be able, when I get to the end, when I face him for my final test, then I can say with a clear conscience that I did my very best to make sure that I was never a stumbling block or that I did not put stumbling blocks in front of those whom I was charged to keep with. Now, I'm not saying that I'm perfect. No person is, but it is something that scares me to this day and continues to scare me that I might be. But the reason that I focus on this passage, it comes from what happened in his story, in Jan's story. And for that, I want to read a little bit of his story. Here is what he says. Here is what says it says in his story. They, this is the four bishops that are in charge of the trial. They told him, if you will humbly confess that you have been wrong, promise never to teach these things again and publicly take back all you have said, we will have mercy on you and restore your honor. And these, this is what Jan tells them. This is his, these are his words. He says, I am in the sight of the Lord, my God. I can by no means do what you want me to do. How could I face God? How could I face the great number of people I have taught? They now have the most firm and certain knowledge of the scriptures and are armed against all the assaults of Satan. How can I, by my example, make them uncertain? I cannot value my own body more than their health and their salvation. The first thing I want us to learn about Jan's story is that we are not supposed to just look to our lives, but to all those who are connected to us. Each of us has been put in charge of at least one other person. I guarantee you, every single person on this earth has been put in charge of at least one other soul. Now, I'm guessing that most of us have been put in charge of more than just one, but I can guarantee you that every single person on this earth, God has placed a soul in their charge, and the kingdom will either be believed or discredited to that person by you and your choices in their eyes. And Jan knew this. Jan knew that if he went before the board and saved his life and gained back his honor, what he was doing was throwing a stumbling block in front of all of those parishioners who had listened to him, all those congregation members who had found their salvation in his word and in his belief in his theology and understanding of the scriptures. And he could not do that in good conscience. So he continued to persevere the torture. He continued to persevere unto death what he had said was true. The second thing I want you to really see in this story is that Jan was not alone. Now, as I said at the very beginning, of course, we're never alone. Jesus is always with us. Remember what he says, pick up your cross and follow me. He's with us. He's not only walking in front of us, he's walking beside us and he's walking behind us. He is always with us. But in this particular case, Jan had a physical presence. He had a friend, a confidant who was with him. A man by the name of Lord John de Clum was a friend and confidant. And his words that he gives to Jan in the throes of the torture, in the midst of this trial, are the words that reinvigorated his tortured body. And in a moment of pure weakness where he could have very easily fallen to the temptation of agreeing with the four bishops and forsaking his state, his preaching and forsaking all those who believed in him, John came forward and gave him a message of not only hope, but of strength and encouragement. I want you to hear these words from John de Clum. 
John McClune paused, searching for the words that would strengthen his friend, and he says, on the other hand, please do not betray your own conscience. It is better to suffer any punishment than deny what you have known to be the truth. After hearing said, him say that, Jan faced his friend and, says that, and said this, as the most high God is my witness, I am ready with my heart and mind to change my stand if the council can teach me by the holy scriptures and convict me of error, which of course they could not. It was that moment when he was about to break, when he was about to lose, when he was about to give in to that temptation. And the reason I want to showcase this is because the martyrs are not perfect. No martyr is perfect. No man or woman is perfect. There's going to come a time when that temptation comes to break you. And even God understands this and he sends us help. I can't tell you what that help is going to be. For Jan, it was the help of a confidant and a friend in John who came to him and gave him these comforting and strengthening words that gave him the ability to stand back up on his own two feet and claim the truth that Jesus had given to him. And with that, I want to read the final piece of Jan's story, how it ends. Given one last chance to renounce his errors, Jan replied, what error should I renounce? I am guilty of no wrong. I taught all men repentance and remission of sins according to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For that gospel, I am here with a cheerful mind and courage, ready to suffer death. What I taught with my lips, I now seal with my blood. Jan was punished for his belief. He was punished for his faith and would suffer death by fire. And as the fire was lit, Jan Hus began to sing a hymn with such a loud and cheerful voice that he was heard over the crackling of the fire and the jeers of the crowd. His song, Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, have mercy on me. Now, I told you before that Jan has a connection with us as Methodists. The movement that Jan Hus started would lead directly to the creation of a group called the Moravians. For those of you that have knowledge of the Methodist history, you know that the Moravians are the group of Christ, groups of Christians who would astound and influence much of what John Wesley would then turn into Methodism. And that the theology that he learned from them was learned most readily and most beautifully on his trek across the Atlantic. When he came from England to Georgia and on a ship traveling that horrible, horrible distance met with a terrific storm. And while everyone else on the ship was scurrying around and feared for their lives, it was the Moravians that caught John Wesley's eye because instead of running around and screaming and fearing for their lives, they circled around on the top deck of the boat and sang praises to God in the middle of a massive, terrible storm. Do you notice anything there? In the midst of the fire that was consuming his flesh, Jan sings so loudly that you can hear his song above the crackling of the flames. In the midst of, the most, of a turbulent oceanic storm, the Moravians sing a praise to God. And in that, John Wesley sees a beautiful manifestation of faith that would eventually influence him to start the Methodist movement that would encapsulate the earth to the point where we would become the Methodist church, the Methodist movement would become the third biggest Christian denomination in the world. Coincidence? I don't think so. I think that it's the spirit. I think that, that was the spirit of Jan Hus combined with the spirit, the spirit of God, to influence the creation of one of the largest denominations of Christians in the world today, one of the greatest churches that has brought 
millions upon millions of souls into the understanding and relationship with their creator and continues to do so to this day. One life, millions brought to relationship. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for Jan, for his life, for his dedication, for his faith, and for his trust in you. While we may never understand and or fully comprehend the danger that he faced that night, the time that he spent in that torture chamber, the time that he spent imprisoned, we may never experience those times in our own lives. But Father, help us to have that kind of strength that no matter what this world throws at us, we can continue to have our focus on you. And we can have our conviction in your spirit. No matter what the cost. And come whatever may. We pray all this in Christ's precious and holy name. Amen.